So, my name is Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is a privilege to serve on staff here at Heart of the City. I don't know all of you. I wish I did, but those who I do know, I love, and I would love to to know all of you. Today, I have a heavy revy for you. I wish it was a light and frosty and toasty. The last time I preached, I preached about sourdough bread, remember? And I talked about the different generations, remember, and how, you know, I'm part of the crusty generation, and then there's the ooey-gooey stuff, and, and, well, today I'm not talking about sourdough bread, because the last time when I preached, all of a sudden I had sour, loaves of sourdough bread showing up at my house, and, and on my desk in my office, I mean, it was amazing, sourdough bread is so cool. So today I'm preaching on roast beef. (laughs) Anybody have any ketchup? Let's have some beef. I'm just kidding. I know, build a bridge. Okay. (laughs) He who the sun sets free is free indeed. Now, that freedom is not to do anything that you want. That freedom is not to say anything you want. There are things that you ought to say, and there's things that you ought not to say. And wise is the man that knows when to speak and when to closes pie hole. James chapter 3 is what we're talking about today. If you have a Bible, turn in your Bible to James chapter 3. We're in a series on dead or alive. Today's message is about a little member of your body that we have to give attention to. It's called the tongue. Now, I have some medicine for you that's not going to go down real easy. It's going to be challenging, okay? But I'm going to just present a little bit of sugar to go with it. Because if you put a little bit of sugar, then the medicine goes down a little easy. Just a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down in the most delightful way. Oh, maybe you have to be a certain age to know that, eh? So I want you to point to the person beside you and say, this is not about you. you. And then point at yourself, it's about me. me. Okay, here we go. Let me say a disclaimer before we begin here. Because we're talking about the tongue. I'm calling it the beast. Do you know that there's a beast that resides inside of you? It is hidden behind the jail of your teeth. And everybody has one. In fact, stick it out. (laughs) We all have a tongue. So here's the disclaimer. Not that I have already attained or am already perfect or am already mature, but I press on to make it my own. Not that any of us in this room is perfect with our tongue. None of us in this room are, we're all in the same water. We're all in the same boat. We've all misused our tongue and there's something for us to pay attention to today. Second Timothy chapter three says, all scripture is breathed by God All scripture is profitable for a teaching. So we're going to teach this morning. It's profitable for reproof. For some of us, it's going to be a reproof. It's profitable for correction. Yes, we need correction. And it's profitable for training in righteousness. So why are all these things important to us? We need to be submitted to it. Why? Because it goes on to say, so that the man or the woman of God may be complete, or that another word may be mature and equipped. So there's something about we do on Sundays and Saturday nights when we gather. We come to a place where we want to equip you for the work of the ministry. We want to equip you to be a mature believer. How many of you understand that none of us have arrived? Now, if you think you've arrived, then we're going to have a conversation, and we're going to have a come to Jesus meeting, because you have not arrived. And the more that you say you've arrived, the more we know you haven't arrived. 
So here's the book of James is important because really the reality of the book is where there is life, there's motion. So the last time you checked, if you're breathing, you're moving, right? So where there's life, there's something happening. There's action. I've heard that bighorn sheep will run towards each other with such velocity, such power, that when they collide, it sounds like a gunshot that reverberates through the mountains because there's life in these sheep when they come together. I've heard that Canadian geese, that's my family because I'm from Canada, eh? Don't be a hosiery. <laughs> will fly in a V for a reason and their positions in the V are, are all important and there's a whole... A Bible series you can do on geese and how that relates to our Christian and spiritual walk. But they can fly for thousands of miles without taking a break because of how they do it and because there's life within them. Sometimes we will keep mementos of things that have life. For example, some of you have an elk head above your fireplace or a, a moose head or a, a deer or an antelope. But I want to tell you something about those heads. They're dead. <laughs> they have no life. In fact, if they move, there's a problem, right? <laughs> they have no life. There's no motion. They're not moving. Their life is finished. When your life is finished, there's no movement. Now you have movement. You have life. James talks about the importance of motion in our spiritual life. Biblical authors often look to nature for analogies to express a spiritual truth. And James is a master at this, where he gives some vivid analogies of things that we will understand and relates it to a spiritual truth so that we can grasp it and make a transformation in our behavior. It's really, really cool. The spiritual realm, when there's life spiritually, there's motion spiritually. James chapter 2 verse 14 says, what good is it, my dear brothers and sisters, if you have, if you say you have faith and you don't show it with your actions? So here's the problem. Lots of times we will come to church. There's an old movie. You will be going like this. This is what you're doing. This is what I want you to do. So sometimes we're good at yakking, we're good at exercising our tonsils about what we're going to do, and blah, 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 oh, yeah. But this is what you need to do, and just put it into action. Put it into your behavior. Put it into the way you live your life. Because lots of times we come to church and we listen to a message. Oh, pastor, that was such a good message. Boom, you rang the bell. Boom, you delivered the mail. Boom, and then you go out and do exactly what you were doing before. And there's a point where you need to kind of adopt the word of God, the truth, and allow it to change your behavior and become more like him. This is what James is kind of helping us do. The book of James let me give you a little bit of a background because this is very important to get the context before we go into what he tells us in chapter three. The book of James will challenge you. The book of James will affirm you. Mm -hmm. I'm doing these things right. The book of James will unsettle you. Pastor, I'd really rather you not talk about that. The book of James will convict you. Whoa. In today's culture, there is no absolute truth. Have you noticed that? Someone will say, well, that's, that's my truth. My truth might not be your truth. Honey, I want to tell you something. Truth is truth. If you're flying in an airplane and you don't have a parachute and you jump out of the airplane, one thing's going to happen. Now, you can say, I don't believe that. doesn't matter if you believe it or not. That's not... Truth is truth. You are going to fall to the ground and go, <laughs> right? Well, that's not my truth. My truth is I will fly like a bird. No, you won't fly like a bird. 
James is the kind of guy that calls sin, sin. He says it what it is. But you see, we don't like that anymore. We don't like to be called, we don't like it to be called sin. It was a mistake. It was a, a miscalculated decision. No, it was sin, it was wrong. James says, right is right and wrong is wrong. The heart of James is that we as believers might be mature, that we might be complete, that we might grow as a believer. James calls us to true community. See, there's something about when we accept Christ, that's an individual decision that you make. But growing, we do that as a community of faith. And he calls us to community composed of relationships, real relationships. And you know where you find that in, in our church? You find it in small groups, where small groups can call you out. Small groups can love on you. Small groups can help you get through stuff, the different seasons in your life. We find community in accountability, where we're accountable to each other, where there's humility with each other, where there's forgiveness. When we do things to other people and we get to forgive each other and move on and build a bridge. Now, interesting to really have this in the back of our mind is that growing up, James is the brother of Jesus. He was not convinced of what Jesus was in those days. That's a big deal. In his own family, he was not really a believer. He wasn't a believer until after the resurrection and Jesus talked to him. And all of a sudden, something transformed in his heart and his life. And he became one of the most vocal speakers for the church, for Christ, after the resurrection. So much so was his convincement that he was martyred. Now that tells me something about what he says in his book that... Wow, I better pay attention because he's got some real words to say to me because this is not just somebody blabbing from the side of his mouth. It's actually someone who's had conviction who was transformed. And if we would pay attention to these words, I think it would really do well in our lives. So today we're going to talk about the tongue. Do we have a picture of the tongue? Everybody, there, there's your tongue. Wow, look at that tongue. Just, you know, just this thing that just kind of sits inside there, yeah. And it's so important for our tongue because we need that tongue to help us to talk, right? Interesting. Out of the same mouth, it says in verse 10, proceeds blessing and cursing. We come to church and we bless. Holy, 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 and then we go out of church and our tongue says other things sometimes. James chapter three, verse two, for we all stumble in many ways. Say the word all stumble, all stumble. We all stumble in many ways. And one of those ways that we stumble is with this little member inside the gates of our mouth. It goes on to say, if anyone does not stumble in his word or with his tongue, he is a perfect man or he is a mature man who is also able to bridle his entire body. If you can control your tongue, you can control the rest of your body. Wow. A teenage boy was selling a lawnmower. And a man came to him and said, I'd like to buy your lawnmower. Does it run? Oh, yes, it runs just fine. And the man goes down, and he does it a couple of times, and it doesn't start up. He says, this lawnmower doesn't work. Are you trying to sell me something that doesn't work? No, oh, I forgot. I got. You have to cuss when you're pulling the thing, and then it'll start. <laughs> the man says, well, bless God. I'm a man of the cloth. I'm a pastor. I haven't cussed in 18 years. I'm not about to cuss to get this thing to work. And a young man said, well, keep on pulling. It'll come back to you. <laughs> Old habits have a way of coming back to us if we don't alter significantly our behavior. 
It's one thing to blab something, and then it's another thing to actually live it out. And if you don't change the behavior, you'll find yourself going back to old ways. Does that make sense? James comes to us in chapter 3, and he confronts something that is an old habit, perhaps, that needs to be addressed in our life, and that is gossip. Gossip is a problem that everybody, everybody in this room is guilty of gossip. Uh, can I have my four volunteers come on up to the front? Here comes my four volunteers. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 8 says, The words of a taste tail bearer are like tasty trifles. Somebody comes to you with some gossip. Because we want to hear the goods, don't we? Well, we have a little story here. Oh, hi, Seth. How you doing, my friend? I'm good. How you doing? I'm doing really good. Hey, man, I got, a, I got something for you. Okay. So uh, I was at the grocery store. Yeah. And I saw Pastor Stephen. He was walking into the liquor store. Uh-oh. And uh, what he was doing was buying non-alcoholic grape juice for a wedding he was officiating. How spiritual of him. Wow. Oh, hi. Hi, Vicalis. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. How are you doing? I'm tired. I'm tired, yeah. <laughs> I got a secret for you. I got a secret. Wait. Shh, say it quietly. Okay, so, I don't know. I saw, or I was told that someone saw Stephen go into the liquor store and buy alcohol. What? Oh. Oh, didn't see you there. How are you? I don't know, man. Uh-oh. <laughs> What's going on? Um, jeez, I don't... Pastor Stephen got drunk. Oh. Wow. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> so many people to talk to. How are you? I'm actually very concerned. Oh, no. I just found out that Pastor Stephen is an alcoholic, and he drinks a fifth of alcohol every weekend, and that's actually why he slurs his words. Oh, no. (laughs) Now, I didn't hear that last part. What was the the last part that I did? Is it time to go? (laughs) Yeah, it's time to go. Monica, we'll have a conversation later. <laughs> now that, thank you guys. Welcome. That is how gossip works. It sometimes begins with an innocent comment. Oh, I saw Stephen go into the liquor store to get some non-alcoholic grape juice for a wedding that he's officiating, to all of a sudden, he's an alcoholic. (laughs) And how many stories have you been a part of that has begun like that and ends up like that, and a person's reputation, a person's character is ruined because we have entertained part of that conversation. What is gossip? Idle talk. Or a rumor. It's a he said, she said. It's not something you actually witnessed, but someone said it to you, and you carried it on. Especially about a person, or about their affairs, or about them and what they have done or haven't done. A person who habitually reveals personal or sensational facts of an intimate nature to others. That's what gossip is. Gossip is saying something, even if it's true, with the intent to cause personal harm or damage to someone. 
And we are all guilty. A gossip is a person who will talk about others with you. And then they will talk to others about you. What's the scope of gossip? James chapter 4 verse 11 says, Do not speak evil of anyone. Ephesians chapter 4 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. (laughs) We should have a repentance time right now for all of us. Because I can pretty much guarantee that there's been some uh, corrupt words that have proceeded out of our mouth. I remember when, when our kids were little and we were living in Denver and Lindsay and Luke were in the back seat and somebody in front of us driving a car did something that I didn't agree with and I called them a name. I think I called them a dipstick. <laughs> and Lindsay pipes up from the back, it's not dipstick, Dad, it's dirt bag. I looked at Susan and I said, where did she get that? (laughs) Out of the mouth of babes, right? I remember I was going to a hockey game in Denver with uh, someone from our church and the Colorado Avalanche, uh, by the way, who won the Stanley Cup this year and they're the best team in the league. Just, I'm not bragging, I'm just reporting. And... uh, (laughs) We're driving down the road towards uh, the Pepsi Center, and I'm with this brother. He's a dear brother, and someone cut us off. And out of his mouth came some words that I was not familiar with. And he just kind of went on. Then all of a sudden, he realized who he was with. And he looked at me and said, "Ah, Pastor Stephen, I never talk like that. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that may impart grace to the hearer. I'm sure when someone cuts you off, you don't say, I'm sure that they are going to a very important appointment. They must be rushing to the hospital. And so therefore they had to cut me off. And so I will extend grace and love and patience to them. Why do we gossip? Number one is we gossip because of pride. Because we find it so much easier to discredit others and make us look better. You see, it's easy to tear down somebody and it's much more difficult to build them up. It's easy to look at someone and say, I'm so much better than that person. I'm so glad I'm not like them. Wow, holier than thou. Pride also is someone who says, I'm in the know. You see, I'm on the inside track. I know what really happened. I know the whole story. And if you'll come close, I'll tell you everything. There's some pride involved with that. We gossip because of idleness. You've heard of idleness as the devil's workshop. You got nothing better to do than to critique somebody else? How about this? How about if we just take care of our own business and let people take care of their business? Instead of us being a a Monday morning quarterback sitting on the bench telling the team how they should do it, maybe we ought to just sit back and just take care of the stuff that we need to take care of. How do you overcome gossip? Romans chapter 12 says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. You know what's interesting about gossip? When someone's gossiping to us, it's an oxymoron uh, because we become afraid to offend, we become afraid to say something to the gossiper in case we offend them. We're so afraid of offending the gossiper. That shouldn't be a problem. Now, that doesn't mean you need to be rude about it. Just you can say things like, let me think of some things that I could say. (laughs) Just 
bring the conversation into accountability. You don't need to be rude. You don't need to unfriend them. You don't need to take them off your Christmas list. Just help bring the conversation into some accountability. For example, you could say, you know what? I just don't really want to hear about it. It doesn't really involve me at all, so I prefer that you not talk to me about it. That's one way you could say it. Another thing you could say, now how do you think we could help this person? Or you could say, may I quote you? (laughs) Or you could say, if so-and-so knew we were talking about them in this way, you know, I really think that they would be hurt. Would you be comfortable if this person walked into our conversation right now? Here's another thing. If, if a gossiper knows that you are a garbage can and will listen to the garbage that you're about to give, they will come to you and they will talk to you. If they know that you're not a garbage can, they won't come to you. So what stink are you giving off? James gives us some practical instruction on taming the beast. Some of the biggest mistakes I make are with my mouth. With my mouth, I have offended my family. With my mouth, I have offended friends. With my mouth, I have offended neighbors and people that I know. The year was 2000. We were planting a church out of Littleton, Colorado, in Parker, Colorado. We had been associate pastors for almost 10 years, and it was the unveiling Sunday where we were going to unveil to the congregation that we were planting a church. We had 15 people that were on our launch team, and this was the big Sunday. Susan and I are sitting in the front row. I'm looking around the room for all of our people, and there's a husband and wife that are not there. And I did a little sidebar conversation with my wife. I said, where are they? They're not here. Well, they're not with us. I can't believe it. What could be so important that they wouldn't be here for this moment in our church? I mean, they're supposed to be on the team and they're not here. <laughs> Call the ambulance. Wow, well, I got up and preached, and you know, we got sent off, and it was a wonderful thing. Tuesday morning, I'm back in the office, and I get on my phone a little message, and it said uh, from uh, Pastor Stephen, "Could you come down to the production office? Uh, we have something that I think maybe you want to listen to." Oh, okay. Um, well, apparently, when they were recording the service. Um, My microphone, like this, was muted to the congregation, but it wasn't muted for the recording. And so everything I said to my dear wife in sidebar was on the master. And I'm going, "Hmm, no, no, no problem. Just take that out, remaster it. And because we haven't fulfilled the orders for the CDs in those days, then no problem. Well, yeah, sort of. But you see, Pastor Stephen, to the launch team, we gave them the CDs right on the spot on Sunday. So your launch team all has the CDs from Sunday, and they've got... Oh. I see. So what do you do? Well, get a remastered one, go to their house and exchange it, and don't tell them nothing. But I still know that. So you know what we did? We remastered it, and I went to each home, talked to each couple, each single. I asked them to forgive me for this beast that was uncontrolled. The hardest visit was the last one, when I went to the couple that wasn't there. Had no idea why I was there. Went in there, told them what happened, told them what I said, got down on my knees in front of them, And I said, would you forgive me for the things that I said? Of course, they were gracious and loving, and they were a part of the team, and they were a big part of our leadership, and they're still friends of ours today. 
He who has control of his tongue sets the direction for his life. So James goes on and he gives three illustrations. He says, the tongue is a bit. I got a horse's bit right here. It says here, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey. Say that with me. Make them obey. We make, now, I'm not a horse guy. In fact, you got a picture up here? There's a picture of me on a horse. That was like 1983. Probably the one and only time I've ever been on a horse. Have you ever stood beside a horse? Freaketh you outeth. <laughs> big eyes, beady eyes, big nostrils. <laughs> no more nostrils. <laughs> Legs that are like, I mean, my leg is like, legs like this. I'm so freaked out by this horse that it's going to go running down the road and I'm going to get wrapped around a tree somewhere. <laughs> but then the trainer explained something to me about a horse. But now I don't, please don't give me an email. I just don't know what I'm doing with horses. But it goes inside their mouth. I don't know if it's this way or this way or this way. But it goes in and it rests on top of their tongue. And the horse learns to obey the bit. Now, you don't have to, mm, the horse to get it to go. You don't have to slap it. You don't have to talk to it weird. You just gently, with the reins, move it to the left or move it to the right. And it has learned to respond to the bit. And the bit above the tongue tells the horse what you want the horse to do. Do you realize that you can do the same thing with your tongue? Because if you can control your tongue, you can control the whole body. If you can control the tongue of the horse, it can control the entire body of the horse. The tongue is a rudder. Chapter, verse 4, it says, Or take ships as an example, although they're so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. It will fight the winds and the currents of the sea, and it will go exactly where that ship weighing tons, where the pilot wants it to go. So our tongue will guide the direction of our life. Thirdly, the tongue is a fire. Verse 5, it says, Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of life on fire, and itself on fire by hell. Isn't that interesting how just a little spark can create so much damage? that it destroys forests. And isn't it interesting that just a little spark, just a little thing that we say can create an incredible calamity. Our tongue is like fruit. Verse 12, can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Folks, if I plant watermelon seeds, I'm not going to get tomatoes. If I plant watermelon seeds, honey, I'm going to get watermelon. So listen to this. We will produce what we are. A rebellious spirit will reproduce rebellion. A critical spirit will reproduce mistrust and doubt. A sweet spirit will reproduce love and acceptance. Your tongue <laughs> is an indicator of what's inside. Listen to these scriptures. In fact, you know what? Just close your eyes. Matthew chapter 12. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Or out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Psalm 10, his mouth is full of curses and lies and threats. Trouble and evil are under his tongue. Psalm 19, may the words of my mouth 
May the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Psalm 37, the mouth of the righteous man utters wisdom and his tongue speaks what is just. Proverbs 10, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. Proverbs 16, a wise man's heart guides his mouth and his lips promote instruction. The book of James is really a New Testament book like the book of Proverbs. It is full of nuggets of truth that if we would give heed to it, it would transform our life. So look up at me. How do we get out? How do we move on from here? First of all, if you need to go to somebody and make it right, do it. Go to them and make it right. And when you go to them and you have, if you've been with your tongue, ask them to forgive you. Say the words, will you forgive me? Here's what not to say. Oh, if I have offended you, would you please forgive me? That's not. That's not asking for forgiveness. That's a cop-out. You know that you've hurt them. Go and say, will you forgive me? And here's the other thing. Matthew chapter 18 says, go to them alone. Don't talk to all your friends and then go to that person. Or go to your friends and don't go to that person. Go to that friend. Go to them and make it right. And say, will you forgive me? Now, if you're on the receiving end of that and someone comes to you and says, will you forgive me? Do not say, well, it's about time. (laughs) I'm so ticked off at you. Yeah, you really hurt me. Yeah, you just devastated. No, don't don't get it. Why? What does that do? Just be gracious to them and say, yes, I forgive you. And allow God to bring reconciliation and healing. Do you know what you're going to find yourself doing? Brenner, give me a second here. This is what's going to happen. You'll be in the shower the next day. This is what's going to happen. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. I don't have the right tune. And like a flood, his mercy reigns. Unending love. Amazing grace, and like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. There'll be something let loose in your life. Hold up these three things for me. Anybody got three fingers? This is what I want you to do this week. I want you to give a message to three different people this week. I want you to send them a text, an email, talk to them in person, tell them that you love them, say something nice about them, something that stands out. When you do this, it just is awesome. The favor of God is with you. I can see the love of Jesus shining through you. I just love this about your character. I love this about you. And just, you know what it'll do? It'll do something. It'll transform them. Or do something like what I would do. I would actually get a card and write it with ink. And then there's these envelopes that you put them in. And you stick it in the envelope. And then you write on the... And then there's little things that you put up in the corner. And you take it to a blue box. There's blue boxes all over town here. Put it inside the blue box. And it'll get mailed to that person. And they'll get the card. And it will mean something to them. Make a difference in somebody's life. And so I ask you, would you do that? And it'll do something in your life as well. So... Thus endeth the lesson, the tongue. So I encourage you, allow Jesus to do what he wants to do with your tongue. We're not perfect yet. We're still growing and maturing. Allow him to continue to refine you and make you what he wants you to be.